All right, folks, I hope you're having a good day, and uh, if you're digging yourself out of snow, well, them's the breaks, right? It's just, I know some people like me, living at the Jersey Shore, barely got any. Uh, I know some folks in Pennsylvania got a ton, and I'm sure in other parts of the country and the world, I guess, I'm sure it's snowing. Uh, for those who don't know, in the northeastern United States, where, which is where I'm based, there is a call for a tremendous snowstorm that for some didn't really materialize and for others was just as phenomenal and tremendous as, you know, the weatherman promised, right? But if you're snowed in, take some solace. We're going to learn about Bitbucket pipelines on our road to being quote-unquote dev ops. That's right. We're doing it, automated testing. We're using a tool that I'm willing to bet a lot of you are probably already using. And if you're not, Bitbucket is a source code hosting solution from the folks at Atlassian. Um, It offers Git, Mercurial hosting, um, issue tracking, things like that. If you're not familiar with the name Atlassian, you probably know them better for their most popular product, Jira, which is a, or Confluence also, which are widely used in the enterprise project management solutions. I believe they also make HipChat, which is like a Slack competitor. So yeah, they, this is really common. Really, uh, you know, most I, many enterprises that I've been to use some Atlassian tool. They may not use Bitbucket, or they may use an on-site version of Bitbucket. But uh, almost all of them I actually have dealt with have been using Jira. So let's take a quick look at the new release from the folks at Bitbucket, Pipelines. Now, Pipelines allow you through the Bitbucket interface with uh, really very little configuration. I mean, we had this set up at Buccaneer for an internal Ruby on Rails project in, I think, 10, maybe 15 minutes. It, it was it was basically trivial. Um, what it does is you go in here, you've, you set it up uh, on your individual repositories. So it has to be your individual source code repos. If you're using the project structure in Bitbucket, you actually have to go down a level and do it for every repo. But what it will do is if you have automated tests, whether those be behavioral tests like BDD style, like RSpec, which is what we do at Buccaneer, unit, more TDD style. I know all these terms are kind of meaningless, right? Um, A lot of people say they're doing unit testing, they need behavioral testing. Um, You know, I call it behavioral or regression testing, but that's, um, you know, we're not going to get too deep into that today. That's probably a conversation for another day. But what it does is it runs your tests for you in your Bitbucket uh, account with no Jenkins, no server setup of any kind. All you have to do is write one configuration file and, you know, write the unit test, which it, just as a quick aside, I know a lot of you IT managers out there are maybe a little reluctant, I have to be honest, for years I was very reluctant about unit testing. I dragged my little hooves in. Uh, go to radio listeners will know that for the first two years I did the radio show, I I just simply did not, I, I just didn't buy it, right? But now I'm pretty much an R-spec true believer, and I'm, I'm a fairly recent convert, so I have, I have all the, you know, the, the vigor of a convert. But let's take a look at, well, let me quickly tell you why, but we're going to do an episode on this later. I understand what you're thinking and that you don't want to do it. You're thinking like I was thinking. This project has a certain budget, whether it's an internal project, a client project, or, or something. Um, you know, and the developers say that doing unit testing, and to be clear, to do test, and let's just call it automated testing, because I don't want to get into the debate about what is unit, what is not. But to, to be clear, no one says it has to be 100% test coverage, right? You, you, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. You, you have to start somewhere. I think one of the best places to start is integration and regression testing. But regardless, I, I, I know why you're not doing it, right? The developers tell you, well, you know, for this sprint, we think it's going to be you know, 80 hours or whatever it's going to be. And they say, but, you know, if you want us to do testing on it, that becomes 90. And that's another now another 10 hours. And you're thinking, well, the project has a deadline. Can I avoid this? And you can. But you're not actually saving development hours. And in fact, I found, and there's plenty of paper, papers from plenty of very smart people, particularly in the Rails community, where you need to think of it less as saving and more of, more as charging it to your credit card, right? I mean, really, you are charging those dev hours to your credit card. And you, you will pay for them at some point. 
And then you may pay for them in QA issues that your users begin to complain about. Um, and that's you know one method of payment. You may pay for it in QA issues that require your developers to actually spend additional dev hours untangling. You may pay for it when you want to upgrade your system or add functionality, and you find that because it was not tested correctly, it is very, it is not modular enough, right? The source code was not written in a, in a modular way, so one function doesn't do one thing, there's side effects, things like that. And it just becomes spaghetti, and it becomes hard to work with over time. That is, I can tell you from experience, that gets very expensive, especially if you are an enterprise, if you are an IT manager at a larger shop. That is going to run you um, some orders of magnitude more every year. You know, the first year you might get away with it, but in five years you're going to be talking about a total system rewrite, which I, you know, I know some of you are my customers that that's. Um, it's how you became my customers, right? Your your applications don't last more than three or five years because you you know you you at one point you focused on the cheapest bid you could get, and one of the first thing vendors cut. And excuse me if you can hear my dog walking around in the background is unit testing, is regression testing, is automation and DevOps, and the application just can't easily be maintained. And at some point, it becomes too hard to work on, and people rewrite it. But that's my little sermon on unit, unit testing, unit regression testing. We, we'll let this go uh, for now. Let's get right into the meat and potatoes of working with the bucket pipeline. So, taking a look here, pretty basic setup, right? I'm just going to scroll you back up the page. You click the setting on right. This panel will look familiar for all of you using Bitbucket. You go through fast feedback loop, great. That's their advertising. Click it on. Then you write one configuration file, and because I just did this myself a couple days ago, let me show you my configuration file for my Rails 5 project. Now this is specific to my project. It may work for you if yours is um, similar enough to what I'm doing, but it is not guaranteed to. <laughs> so I would make sure you know uh, you know that you're taking that into account. So as you can see, I have it open in Vim here. This is a modification of one of the standard ones that Bitbucket gives you. Um, one little tricky thing, and they do warn you about this here, only use spaces to indent your .yml file. You can't use tabs. No tabs. So uh, the guy from Pied Piper, Pied Piper would not be happy with this file. But it's spaces, not tabs. And for the eagle-eyed folks in here and my fellow Docker fans, which if you don't know a lot about Docker, I encourage you to check out the last video where we discussed Docker. Um, it is a .yml file, which is normally used for a Docker configuration. Guess why? This is another awesome use of Docker. The folks at Bitbucket actually have this entire pipeline system running with Docker. That's how this all works. So let's go through my file. Um, I'm just give you a quick overview. Image Ruby 2.3.1, right? Again, this is a Rails 5 app, so obviously Ruby. Just specify what version of Ruby you're using. Um, pseudo app get update. It's Linux. It's apparently some form of Ubuntu. Uh, apps get install, build essential. These are just, this is a requirement for what I'm doing. And the rest of it's very standard Rails, uh, you know, stuff, right? We have bundle install, all the rake stuff. And this last line is really the, the key. Um, RSpec, right? Bundle execute RSpec. RSpec is the uh, BDD testing framework that we use at Buccaneer. So we were in the good position of actually already having all of our tests written for this. I mean, all up to date, not all forever. This is something we're still working on. If you don't, obviously there's a little longer step of writing some tests. But this took five minutes. Uh, the deployment itself uh, was a simple git push. That's how pipelines work. So you push any branch to your Bitbucket repo that has pipelines enabled, and it will it will attempt to run this file. We were actually able to very quickly and very easily within that 15 minute setup time that I, I kind of mentioned before, set this up in Slack. So what happens for us is you, you push the git repo, it runs the build in pipeline, and in addition to the email that Bitbucket sent, you get a Slack message. We have a shared dev channel that gives you the status of the build. So first will come up processing, 
Then if it succeeds, it gives you a little green, you know, green notification. That's good. And if it doesn't, you get a red notification and um, you can even get a log of what's wrong or you can just log into Bitbucket and, and get the log. Um, and usually what is wrong is a test failed. So, I mean, that's great. I mean, if you take a look at this file, you can see that we're seeding our database, we're setting up our database. Um, obviously, that means that some of our tests require the database to be seeded, right? You'll notice that this app is just using an SQLite database. There's no real database setup here other than the schema. Your mileage may vary if you need a different database, but again, that would be maybe one or two more lines. That's not a huge deal. So yeah, I, I really would encourage you to take a look at this because the future is is definitely going in this more DevOps direction. Um, you know, I've done a number of projects now and over and over again, the DevOps path of developers kind of working to maintain their infrastructure hand in hand with IT instead of being sort of, you know, against IT, right? Where the IT guy is like, no, you can't have my server and the developers guy, but I need to get my job done. And, you know, they're butting heads. That is, uh, that's kind of passe. And if, if that's the kind of culture you still have or the kind of, I guess, workflow you still have, I would encourage you, we're actually running an offer at Buc Buccaneer um, to do a, a low cost, I think it's uh, $700. I think it's, it's actually $500. DevOps blueprint for you. So what we would do is take where you are now, look at everything you have. We would only do it for one project for that uh, for that price, obviously. And we would say, okay, how can we move this from where you are now to a more DevOps workflow that has automation, that has testing, that um, you know, hopefully decreases tension between your IT and development teams, um, and obviously speeds up uh, not only production deployments but makes them less error prone, right? So so the goal here is, you know, this is the magic promise. Cheaper, faster, better. <laughs> you know, it's the iron triangle, but hopefully we're going to get it. Um, and we've seen a lot of success with moving people to this more DevOps-focused world. So I'd encourage you to go ahead. There's going to be a link in the show notes here. Um, also, we have a deeper dive into this on Buccaneer.io. Go ahead and fill out the form, and uh, we'd love to talk to you about getting you on that DevOps blueprint. Thank you so much, and I'm hoping to have another video up the rest of this week. Apologies for the dog sounds in the background, and I hope you guys enjoy the snow, because <laughs> I did not. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Bye.